G'day guys, welcome back to my channel, my name is Wildcard. Thank you for watching the Wildcard Rugby Show, and you are here today because you want to see something amazing. We're going to be watching Billy Vinopola taking a taser shot to the chest. While he was in Spain a couple weeks ago, he was uh, arrested for refusing to leave a bar, got a bit rowdy, and uh, yeah, just having a good old time being Billy Vinopola, the absolute beast. Okay, so, so he looked like he's laughing. I think the police are telling him to get it on the ground. He's just like, ha ha, try to tackle me, boys. Bam! Taking <laughs> a shot right to the side. <laughs> just watch that again. It's just like, bam! <laughs> right on the side of his body. And uh, surprisingly, he didn't even go down. He's just standing there, like, what's wrong, man? Chill, dude. Relax. Apparently, it took him two shots to get him to the ground. And uh, yeah, this guy. This guy's a good, good rugby player and a special, special human being. What a, what a man. <laughs> Taking two shots to get him down to the ground from the policeman. Yeah, Billy Vinopola, guys. So, let's talk about something more serious. The Melbourne Rebels, like we talked about last week, there was a proposal for the Melbourne Rebels to basic, for, for the creditors to basically take a 15 cents to the dollar loss on their unsecured debts. Uh, to try to save the Rebels team. And like I said last week, this was an attempt for the management to save themselves. So the votes came in, and I'm actually pretty happy about some of the, some of the decision that was made. The votes came in, uh, leveled, and then it was the, ultimately the PricewaterhouseCoopers voluntary administ administrator, Stephen Long Longley, voted the final vote to keep the club alive, to not dissolve the club. So the Melbourne Rebels is staying alive and they have basically accepted a cash injection from the so-called uh what do you call it so-called um uh this uh private investment group that's going to come in and take over the 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 club and merge it with the western united a league with 25 million dollars but as part of the proposal like i talked about last week is about saving the management this is this proposal will save the management and that's something that rugby australia and the tax office is not happy about. Both Rugby Australia and the tax office voted against, you know, the to write down the debt, you know, 15 cents to the dollar, voted against it. But because the votes were tied, uh, the, the, the dividing vote was voted by, you know, the, the voluntary am administrator to go to save the club, to not, you know, to, to take the deal, essentially. So Rugby Australia and the taxation office is basically forced to take the deal. And Rugby Australia... Is not happy about this. I'm, I'm, I agree because you shouldn't be bailing out the, 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 the idiots that run the club into the ground uh, and hiding, you know, hiding all the debts, hiding all the, you know, all, all their tracks for five years. It definitely should be punished. Because Rugby Australia could potentially not give them the renewal for the Super Rugby license after the, you know, after the merger. So they, they could just literally be like, hey, we're not gonna, if your management stays or. You know, don't don't follow our rules, which is not going to give you the license to play in Super Rugby. So that's a, a tool that Rugby Australia can go to get their money back, despite being forced to take the the loss here. And the second thing for the taxation office as well, they they basically they voted against the um they voted against the the right write off, but they now say now because now the write off has been passed because the other members they now basically saying that the 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 liability the tax liability of eleven point five million dollars will go on to the directors and which is something that uh might go to court and something that the as part of the deal they're not happy that the you know obviously the, the directors propose this deal like it, it, to save themselves that's not something that they were expecting i think they should go down with 11.5 million tax there because they would it's yeah like they should probably go to like criminal you know uh criminal trial for you know for for i don't know for uh what do you call it for fraud right they're literally running the business and hiding their losses for five years and voiding taxes you should be like investigated for fraud instead of they're trying to get themselves bowed out with the backing of this new firm so yeah really really weird and interesting stuff but uh you know it is what it is mate you know the, the, the rebels if they wanted to get themselves out of it you got to get rid of the cancer that is operating underneath so the july internationals uh referees has been announced there's uh, a big big few games that's going to be playing obviously South Africa versus versus Ireland, All Blacks versus England, Australia versus Wales, and Argentina versus France. So there will be a few big games, and the referees has been announced. There will be there's actually one game 
First game will be South Africa versus Wales at Twickenham for the Qatar Airway NBS Saudi Oil Money Cup. Uh, this, ref- this will be refereed by Chris Busby from the Ireland Rugby Football Union. And then there will be Australia versus Wales, the first game. Pierre Brousset, a French referee. Uh, he'll be backed by two New Zealand referee. Hopefully, we'll keep the French referee in check. And then the big one, South Africa versus Ireland, the first game will be by Angus Gardner who are from, from Australia, who I think will do a great job for that. I think Gardner, since Barnsley retired, Gardner is probably the best referee in the world now. So that'll be really good for, for South Africa and Ireland game. <clears throat> Argentina, France, Chris Busby, the first game. And then the second game, Australia versus Wales, Nika Ashuma Kelly from Georgia. And England versus New Zealand, the first game, Nick Barry from Rugby Australia. So that'll benefit New Zealand quite a bit because, you know, the uh, Nick Barry probably has, you know, not, not just having a bit of a relationship with the players, but I think Nick Barry, the way that Super Rugby has been refereed is a little bit more lenient than they are used to in the Northern Hemisphere. So I think New Zealand will be able to get away with a few a bit, little bit more than if they would have had an international test, uh, like a northerner referee. South Africa versus Ireland, Carl Dixon, this will be a difficult one. Uh, but then again, South Africans play mostly in the Northern Hemisphere anyway, so probably wouldn't really matter f- from the RFU. Uh, D- Carl Dixon's actually got a lot better as a referee, believe it or not. I think he's actually taken uh, a more of a... He's actually much better than he, he used to be. He doesn't just give out yellow cards. Um, you know, whenever something happens, he actually a bit more lenient than that these days. Argentina versus France, Andrew Brace from Ireland. Australia versus Georgia, James Stolman. New Zealand, Fiji, Matthew Carley. This is not going to good for Fiji because this is the same referee that refereed the game between Fiji and Wales at the Rugby World Cup, who was very lenient towards Wales. <clears throat> South Africa versus Portugal, the final game with Holly Davison. And that is pretty much all the big games. And then on the weekend was the Champions Cup semifinals. Two big games. I watched both these games. Leinster versus Northampton Saints in front of like 82,000, the biggest crowd ever um, in, in Ireland. Uh, what is it? Crows Park? Is that what they call it? And uh, yeah, a Croke Park. Yeah, it was uh, re- really interesting because James Lowe scored like three tries extremely easily. And then the Leinster just went into like autopilot. Northampton Saints hardly had that much opportunity to score, but every time they did, they just got themselves back, got themselves back. Uh, Despite overwhelming dominance, I would say, the Leinster, Northampton Saints almost pulled something out of the bag with only a three-point loss, 17 points to 20 by the end of the score. So it wasn't the most clinical performance. Jax Nienaba came out and basically talked about the polish of the attack, can't miss that many opportunities against the better team. The second game... Uh, Toulouse versus Harlequin. This was a really, really exciting game. The, you know, Anton Dupont is playing for Toulouse. Um, Harlequin, Marcus Smith, and has been, you know, the, the Harlequins has been on fire, put out a couple big upsets. And this game, Toulouse was firmly dominant. The Harlequins came out really slow. There was a few sloppy plays, led to some free points for the Toulouse in the first half. And then eventually, uh, Harlequins probably had an opportunity at 77th minute to chase the game down. Uh, stupidity to Joe Mahler decided to slap Thomas Ramos on the back of the head after Harlequins had a penalty and could have, you know, set the Harlequins up for final opportunity to, to, to potentially go for a haymaker play. But yeah, the stupidity slapped resulting in the penalty being reversed. And, um, yeah, it was just, just look at this slaps in the head. Resulting penalty getting reversed and it's just stupid. And Joe Mahler came out publicly and apologized, but um, yeah, it was just really, really bad way to, to, to end the game. Danny Kerr has given another year to his illustrious career. 37 years old, he's going to be getting another year with the Harlequins uh, next year with his contract extension. The, in the Challengers Cup, which is the lower rank, the Sharks has beaten Clermont to go to the final uh, against... Who are they playing against? Um, against Gloucester. Now the Challengers Cup is is basically the losers bracket from the champ. The Champions Cup. The Champions Cup is basically the top eight of each of the three um, tournaments: URC, the English Premiership, and then the French top fourteen. It's basically the top eight teams from each of the three eight. I think it's eight. Eight. Yeah, I think it's eight. From each of the three teams together, that's the Champions Cup, and then the remainder teams go into the Challengers Cup. So the Sharks is basically in the Challenge Cups final. Uh, against Gloucester. Now, moving on to Super Rugby, the 
next this weekend with some pretty, pretty big games. The biggest one this weekend is the Blues versus the Hurricanes. I don't know if you can actually say this. It's really, really small. Blues versus Hurricanes, top of the table clash. And uh, massive, massive, massive again this weekend. Uh, obviously, last weekend, the Reds beating the Crusaders in Christchurch in a 25-year you know, drought-ending win. It was quite, quite spectacular. Uh, the coaches made some pretty interesting decisions from the Crusaders. I thought, you know, having Halfpenny on the field, uh, who was clearly not in, in form at all, and then Scotty Barry came back and immediately suffered a back spasm, but he is okay. He's going to be playing this weekend. And also uh, having David Havili at 10, I thought was just okay at best. So it wasn't the best Crusader setup. And uh, the Reds was able to take that historical wing on the weekend. But let's talk about this coming up week. Hurricanes versus the Blues. Uh, this is a top table clash. This is the, the, the two biggest scrums in the entire competition. It's going to go head to head, especially for that to solidify themselves with that black jersey, Tyrell Lomax, uh, it's going to be up against Ofa Tuanga Fasi, who are just so dominant in the scrummaging. Tuanga Fasi, his ball handling might not be the best, but his scrummaging, this is going to be a, a battle to, to be to behold Tyrell Lomax, uh, the all black starting tight head. Uh, they're not, you know, obviously Jordy Barrett and TJ Piranard gets added back into the Hurricanes starting 15, and it is also the wingers are up against each other for potential black jerseys or spots as well. Caleb Clark, Mark Talea on the blue side. Uh, Kenny Laholo will be looking at a potential potential spot in the black jersey over, you know, the I guess the Talea and um, and um, uh, Caleb Clark, who are probably the favorites at the moment. So yeah, really big battle battles there as well. Uh, the Hurricanes has recognized the Blues is a bit of a one-trick pony. Just forwards. The Blues has been, especially in the last few rounds, just... Really didn't have much going on in the back line. Uh, it was just all their forwards dominance. And so the Hurricanes has identified that and opted for a 6-2 bench split, which will add to that pressure to the big, big, big Blues 4-pack. I mean, this this pack is just brutal. Patrick Tupolotu, absolutely brutal. Uh, Hoskins or Tutu as well, just huge, huge, huge run, like, you know, run meters, carries for the Blues uh, throughout the season. And uh, the big foot loss for the Blues is number 13. Riku Yuwani had a concussion last week, so he's going to be out of this match with AJ Lamb taking his place. So really big match this weekend. Uh, the the Crusaders is going to be playing Highlanders this weekend. And again, they have made the right decision to drop Halfpenny. Johnny McNichol has, was just way better than Halfpenny last week. Uh, Halfpenny was pulled off the field about 44 minutes in the second, ha in the second half. So four minutes in the second half was taken off the field. Uh, half David Havili gets number 10 jersey once again. I mean... You mean, I mean, you know, I know they say they want to try him out for the All Blacks, but surely you're going to shoot really prioritize, you know, growing your next generation, right? Ray and I will be, pro I mean, I will probably put Ray and I on and just have Havili um, either coming off the bench or go back for the 12 jersey because it's just, yeah. But the, the All Blacks returns to, you know, a couple of big All Blacks returns for the, for the, for the Crusaders, which is really exciting. Tamari Williams pulled his hamstring in the first game of the season. Cody Taylor has returned due to injuries as well. And Scotty Barrett, despite taking coming off the field really early with a with a back spasm, he's going to be back this weekend, which is really, really, really good to see. And uh, yeah, and finally, I think that the last bit we want to talk about is for this weekend is the Chiefs team. The Chiefs are going to be playing Moana Pacifica, so not the most threatening match of the season. But the Chiefs has a few injuries that they're gonna be um they're gonna be keeping a close eye on. So David McKenzie had a concussion last week. I did he actually have a concussion last week. I don't think he had a concussion last week. I think he was taken off the field. But I don't think he had a concussion. I, I mean, uh, someone have to correct me on this. I'm pretty sure he was taken off the field for not wearing the concussion mouth guard. So you nowadays you have to wear the concussion mouth guard that detects the impact uh, on the player's head. And uh, you know, and he was basically not wearing the the prescribed mouth guard. He was wearing his own mouth guard, and then he was taken off the field because of that. I don't think he actually had a concussion, but it says he had a concussion. I think they probably just want to rest him instead of a concussion. But hey, someone please let me know. I'm pretty sure during the game they said that he was taken off the field because he wasn't wearing the correct mouth guard, uh, and then he wasn't allowed to come back on. It wasn't a concussion. So let me someone confirm this. Sean Stevenson has a hamstring injury. Uh, Sammy Penny Finau has an ACL in uh, AC joints. Sorry, no, it's AC joints the shoulder. This one here, I've had this injury as well. So he's going to be out for a while. Uh, Jimmy Tupo is out. 
to an ice hockey nose fracture and Josh Lord uh, still has an ear injury not able to join the team. And so, yes, New Zealand rugby is, you know, again, the struggle to keep players play domestically. I'm uh, pretty sure, I actually forgot to put that in this article today. Hunter Paisami is uh, looking at a deal with the English team, um, the Chiefs, extra Chiefs. So apparently they're going to be signing with that them pretty soon. So yeah, that's, that's I, I don't know. I don't know how Rabbi Australia is going to manage that. But Hoskins, so 2 2, signed with the Blues to 2026. Uh, he's making this resurgence back for the All Blacks jersey. And there was some talks, a lot of talks about Richie Moonga coming back to New Zealand rugby. Uh, there was, you know, Razor Robinson basically wants to open up the overseas selection law to allow him to play. Uh, but the, you know, the manager, the, 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 uh, the, the general manager of the All Blacks rugby, Chris Lendrum, basically saying that they're working with him to try to get him to come back legally, maybe offer him sabbaticals, maybe offer him opportunities to go overseas as a break and you know still having him signed domestically to allow him to play for the All Blacks. Now his contract is currently speculated at 2.2 million New Zealand dollars per season. I mean that is a lot of money and he doesn't even have to play international test matches. So yeah that is um that is an incredibly high amount of money. Uh, I mean I don't know if New Zealand rugby can afford that to to get him back. I mean my goodness um you know, I'm pretty sure Bowden Barry is probably only going to be like 1. 1. 1.2, maybe 1.5, uh, 2.2. That is ridiculous amount of money uh, for, New, for New Zealand rugby to match up. So they're going to have to work out something with him. Uh, I did some, did, some, um, did some research as well. So for the All Blacks, if you do play for the All Blacks, you are going to get what's called the assembly fee, which is that just by being in the squad, you're going to get a weekly fee of $7,500. So you could potentially get, you know, if, if the if the test season goes for like, you know, 20, 30 weeks, um, you could be looking at quite a bit of money there as well. But even with those money, you know, if $7,500, let's say it goes for, um, you know, um, yeah, probably not going to be 20, 30 weeks. We're going to be like 20 weeks in terms, of, in, terms of, in terms of the test season, right? So if you get 20 weeks of the test, test season, um, you know, It'll be like what, like, is how much is it? How much is it gonna be? Like uh, fourteen, fifteen thousand? No, not fourteen, fifteen thousand. Yeah, is it fourteen? Yeah, it'd be like. Well, how much is it gonna be like? How much is that gonna be? Seven thousand five hundred dollars a week for twenty weeks. Anyway, I'm I'm. What is it gonna be? Like hundred fifty thousand? Really? It's like hundred. Yeah. Anyway, it's gonna be quite a bit of money for the All Blacks. Um, but yeah, that's basically how it works with the All Blacks. You get the, you get a, a fee for, for being in the team. But yeah, it depends on how long the season is. Depends your availability for the team. And uh, yeah, so even that, in addition, he's still not gonna make it two point two million for Richie Moonga. And he doesn't have the play test season. He can just sit at home and do nothing, and still get paid. He doesn't have to actually go travel. So yeah, um, Scott Seo is committed to extra Chiefs, a prop that. Uh, Australian rugby is probably have to consider to bring him back because the the lacking of talent in the propping positions at the moment in Australia. So Scott Seal might have to get the special open door treatment to come back to play for the Wallabies um, on the you know on the Ghetto slot uh, under the Ghetto slot maybe even without the Ghetto slot. Uh, Joe Smith has further I- reiterated that he's going to be looking at mostly selecting from domestic talent pool, but I think the prop position is really thin. Like, uh, Hunter Paisami as well is going to the extra chief, as I already talked about. Uh, there has been a bit of, a, like I said, the prop situation is a bit of an issue. Waratahs is going to have, has basically taken Pong Fa'ama Maosili and Irike Pier, Pierento on a loan deal to fill out their, um, fill out their front row issues at the Waratahs, and the both players are just, you know, will have the option to go back to their original clubs by the end of the season. Now, moving to South Africa, Elton Genshis has released a bit of a statement this week that basically suggesting that he's going to be, he's been banned at the moment for using clean butanol. You know, when you see a substance with the word clean in it, clen, not clean, clen, clen butanol, uh, you might think that it's 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 gonna it's gonna be undetectable, but hey, he is um, 
he's definitely banned for four years and he has basically come out and stated that he he is is looking at you know work he's basically claim innocence and he's basically we're looking at uh you know finding some evidence to clear his name and basically he thinks that he'll be back to playing rugby sooner than people might think so sooner than the four year suspension that has been given uh, Darcy Swain is moving from Brumbies to the Western Force next year. Uh, Mike Brown has been suspended for swearing, I guess, verbally abusing the referee after getting two yellow cards in one incident. So basically, he committed two fouls, two cynical fouls at the breakdown, and the referee basically gave him two yellow cards at the same time, and he was not happy about that. And so he went to the hearings that he was giving five weeks suspension for the verbal abuse, but didn't get any time for getting two yellow cards. Interesting. Ah, uh, yes. So the war between rugby league and rugby union has spilled over to New Zealand and the New Zealand Warriors, you might hear this a lot, up the was. So it's basically the New Zealand Warriors has been, you know, looking at building towards a premiership win for their, for the rugby league club. I'm pretty sure John Kerwin played at the Warriors. Uh, as well when he was coming up, coming through. So it has been revealed that Warrior has signed 36 players straight from rugby union high schools into their developmental squad. So that is quite a lot of players and there's quite a lot of prospect from the big colleges, from the high schools, the core colleges that filter out the you know, international test players. They have been taking some, um, some people out of there. Uh, finally, there's a couple more. Stu Hogg has been given a court order to, um, for domestic abuse to be appear in court to his wife. I'm pretty sure his ex-wife now. I think he's divorced now. He's dating somebody else, I think. And uh, finally, Baron Kelleher also found guilty of domestic violence. Ugh, disgraceful. Anyway, um, that is pretty much it for the news this week, guys. Let me know your thoughts about any of these articles. Let me know your thoughts about Benny Pollock getting tased. And uh, thanks for watching. Have a good week. I'll see you guys tomorrow for the Super Rugby review. Have a good week. Cheers, guys.